There we go. Hi, Nancy. How Hi, are you? Now. I'm great. How are you doing? Good. Good. We're getting a storm, lots of water. Oh, another, yes, I read another. Yeah. Another. Is, this is, is this ETA you're getting, ETA? Exactly. And yeah. this is the end of the hurricane season for Florida. So yeah. the month of November, we usually get flooded. So what can I say? Crazy. But you look bright and sunny over there. You've got nice sunshine coming through your window. And we're, <laughs> we're going to be getting um, high 60s and into 70 degree weather for the whole next week. Nice. So this nice. is amazing weather for us. So it's great. Yeah. 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 No, yeah. It's been the wettest, rainiest. Uh, it's been very wet. I love water. I love to swim, but I don't like to be in a swampy atmosphere humidity right. You know. right right so right. what's new with your research the uh, the research well, that never ends we can never <laughs> stop right now hey let's talk about research that never ends that's a good thing you bring up that's great never ends. Never um, ends. yes now that now that Lisa Perlman's book has come out, and now that we've done our Zooms together, I've I've gotten uh, reinvigorated about the case. Oh, and so now I have to know about all the third party people. We know about Lindbergh. We know about Ann, and we know about some of these main people. But I'll show you in in not any specific order. Um, Wild Bill Donovan. I have that book. Yeah. Yes, a yeah. buddy of a friend of Breckenridge's. Yeah. So I thought I should read that. Have you um, read it yet? Have you read that book yet? No, it's about number 50 on my list to read. <laughs> <laughs> number 50. <laughs> yeah. And then I know you know about this one. Right. About Oni Madden. Um, his actual first name was Owen. That's why you get him mixed up with Owen Mimi. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and then I thought I should read about Alice Parker, master detective, Alice Parker. Oh, is that the one written by Reisinger? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have that book. Yeah. He has quite a few errors in this, in just the first five pages. Really? Yes. I don't know if I marked them down. Well. Um, oh, yeah. So, for example, <laughs> when Betty went in to check, this is only on the second page, okay? But he says, when Betty went into the bedroom at 10 o'clock, it says she didn't want to disturb him. But yes, she always disturbed him, but because that was the time for him to go potty. Right. Uh, yeah, so he's, yes, even the, but that's, that's okay. That's a minor mistake. Yeah. Um, then this one looks fascinating to me. This is an Eric Larson book. Do you know this book? Yep. I want to, I, I want to, to that. pardon me? I used to do book reviews around Florida on that, The Garden of the Beasts, right? In the garden, he's a wonderful author. Yes, I, yes. I mean, he's sold how many million copies of his books? But I wanted to read this to know what Lindbergh knew about Germany when he was interested in living there. Right. Um, yeah, so I'm interested in that. Then a book I've had for quite a while that I haven't read yet. I have so many books I haven't read right now. I see. So <laughs> okay, this is kind yeah. of plain on the front, plain yeah. on the back. But the spine of it says, let me see better, 
Psychological Care of Infant and Child by Watson. Yeah. This was Anne's right. baby Spock back right. then. Right. So I'm kind of looking forward to reading this book on how you're supposed to keep your hands off your baby back then. Can you yeah. believe that? Can you believe that? Well, I, I have one little quote here. Um, let me find my quote. Um, they're kind of a dumb here. Let me, I hope I can, um, since I moved upstairs. Yeah, I've got it here. Yes, she's written in 1930, a note, a letter. Um, she's talking about the baby. I don't want to fondle it at all. She's talking about the baby. What is she saying? She's saying this. Um, in one of her diary entries? In her, in, in her book, Hour of Gold, Hour of Lead. Really? And she's talking, yeah, she's talking about it not after, not too long after the baby was born, back in the summertime. Isn't that and strange? then this was interesting. She's, she was writing to. Um, That's very sad. Yeah, she said, this is, um, I don't have the date on here. I have the book, but she says, the baby developed a small trouble very small but of course it may be weep to have a thing come up and which she doesn't explain uh and mother took him to the baby doctor what? she didn't even take him what day did he have oh, pardon you don't have the book in front of you that's okay yeah yeah uh, that's okay i don't want to take the time yeah yeah um so hands off. And then again, we're talking about this is this is 1931. The baby's like a year and a half in November. Charles admits the boy is good looking and pretty interesting. Took him a year and a half to admit it. Yeah. To admit it. Oh, this is very interesting. Um, hour of gold, hour of lead. Now we all know the baby was 20 months old when he was taken. This is her preface to the second section, the hour of lead part. On the evening of March 1st, 1932, our 18 month old child, yeah, she Charles Lynn, isn't that? Yeah, she doesn't That's know the her. age of her own child. No. I know yeah. people have noticed that in the forum when I had the forum attached oh, to my okay. business, people would make these comments. I uh, I lost everything pretty much, uh, but there were comments like that because you know most of us know more about the case than Ann Morrow knew. <laughs> uh, she, probably yeah. more about her child than she knew. Uh, I still think it's possible that she didn't even know what was wrong with her child because she, as I explained, was under anesthesia when he was born. And it's possible the doctor told Charles Lindbergh, the father, that something was wrong with the child and his mother, the mother didn't necessarily have to know. No. I mean, that's there was, one of there was one time, and I, I haven't saved it out, but one time she wrote in her journal that she was um too tired to get up with the baby and so she had uh betty apparently wasn't there just elsie and ollie and so she had elsie take care of the baby i mean yeah a little bit crazy yeah well i remember when my son was born and i was taking care of him there were times that i wished 
somebody would have diapered him for me. But I was a poor woman, like most women can't afford a full-time nursemaid. We're not a JP Morgan uh, entities that can afford uh, people round the clock, 27 servants waiting on you hand and foot. And I've seen women, uh, wealthy women, when I was young and had my infant, I, I knew people who had nurses and I used to watch them operate and I couldn't figure it out. Like, why would any woman who just gave birth want to give <laughs> this precious package to uh, a stranger that you're paying? I don't know, I, it's just me. But when I read Ann Morrow's uh, accounts in her diary, and let's face it, much of it has been um, fooled around with, to be kind, it's been fooled around with. Uh, her husband was alive when they were uh, talking about publishing them. Uh, when I read it, I don't trust a lot of things that I'm reading. But on the other hand, I'm, I, I don't like reading her books because she's so spoiled and so privileged. And uh, her attitudes about like the part you pointed out to me where she's on the subway. Uh, I don't have it in front of me, but you sent me a note. She's on the subway and she's looking at the people across from her and she's denigrating the way they look and that she's not a person who could function in a normal society. She only had a move around wealthy, privileged people like herself. That's all she really knew. That's all she knew. And when you think of it, here she had, um, even if Betty Gao wasn't there all the time, Anne, like other moms, new moms, didn't have to do any cooking or cleaning or anything like that. Yeah. She was, she had complete freedom to only take care of the baby. Right. There's another quote that I have somewhere about her. I held the baby a couple of times. It's just a a tragic, it's tragic to read. Yeah. Like us, it doesn't, it's not, I, I don't know. You know, I'm sure if I were wealthy, I'd be like her. So what am I complaining about? You know, I can't be hypocritical. If I were filthy rich, I'd probably do those things myself. I, I don't know. I, it's hard to judge, but I don't like reading her diaries for this reason. <laughs> I can understand that, yeah. But I must reread them because I periodically go there. You are, you have been reading them all the time, right? Yes, I have been, yeah. So tell yeah. us some other things that are extraordinary that you found about her, her relationship with her child and her relationship with her husband. Um... Well, first of all, I I went back early in in Lisa Perlman's book and started to see more together when because I was looking for it. What Lindbergh wanted for a, a let's put it bluntly, a breeding mate, right? Right. right. And, you know, everyone, his spouse had to be so perfect. In fact, Lisa Perlman said that he would take a woman swimming so he could see her body more and see how it was proportioned. Oh, yeah. yeah. Where did he yeah. take her swimming? I don't know that he took Anne swimming, although she was a very good swimmer, but he used to take women before that swimming. She said, yeah. Not women. Yeah, I know because he didn't know women, but maybe but that's that's all I know. She didn't say, but that's what she said. Really? I've yeah. never heard anything like that. Yeah. I've never heard that Lindbergh. Uh, hmm. Yeah. Um, but her, his, his, he needed somebody perfect as though he came from perfect stock. He thought he was perfect stock. 
Yeah, of course he was. He went to Paris. What's that? Of course he was perfect. He went to Paris. Yes, he he did. He did a thirty-three and a half hour flight. His right. claim to fame. Right. Beyond that, I'm yeah. Um, his mother herself was un, mentally unstable. In fact, Berg says in his book, at least two generations of Lodges and Moros had been afflicted with mental illness. Berg says that. Berg says that on page 529. Two generations of? Two, at least two generations of Lodges and Moros had been afflicted with mental illness. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know the ins and outs of Evangeline Lodge Land's father, uh, other than he was a dentist and an inventor, but he went bankrupt. Oh, I didn't know. Yes, that was on page 17 of Berg's book. Fascinating. So um, his own family, I mean, the American Eugenics Society required these four things for being appropriate, appropriate human being. That's terrible, but that's the truth. Acceptable, acceptable. acceptable. Right. Appearance, <laughs> behavior, intelligence, and health. Now, his grandfather was an embezzler in Sweden and had to flee to avoid prosecution. Right. And he left seven children and his wife right. in Sweden before he came with his mistress right. in Lindbergh's father. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't um, behavior that we think is superior in any way, shape, or form. And then his grandfather had Lindbergh's father, CA, and six other children here in the States before he got married. What do you mean? So Lindbergh's grandfather left seven children right. in Sweden, right. came over with his mistress and their one son, and right. continued to have the grandfather six other children before they got married, before he married his mistress. You, I don't I, I know about um, Perry. Wasn't there Perry Lindbergh? His father had a brother named Perry. But I understood that the six children in Sweden came to America. Two brothers came, I understand. Uh -huh. And they've helped fill in the story about Lindbergh a little bit. Yeah. It says, yeah. But yeah. Well, he doesn't come from perfect stock. There's no such thing. <laughs> There's no, no. Such thing. no. There There's really no isn't. such thing. He himself. He himself was not the exemplar. He was a high school dropout. No, no. Oh, well, he didn't go to school because he didn't. Well, be, exactly yeah, because he could out. get out of it. He didn't want to finish. Right. He got an he got an easy out right. to work on the farm. Yeah, but he never, you know. Maybe they gave him a diploma, but it's not because he really finished up and marched across the stage right, right, right. yeah uh he was expelled from college right even though his mother ghost wrote some of his papers isn't that something yes he, he was homework for him yeah <laughs> he was disliked by his high school classmates he had no friends he had no friends Two, he was so disliked. Two, his two dogs were murdered. Both of them? I know one that uh, there were two dogs that were killed. Dingo and Wagush were both oh. murdered. One with a crowbar, one was shot. Oh my God. 
God, I know about the shooting, but a crowbar? Yes, the first one was a crowbar. He found the dog uh, crowbarred at the bottom of a well. Oh, no. Oh, my goodness. They must have hated the whole family, not just... Yes, no one liked Evangeline. Right. She was high and mighty and snooty. Right. And she was a city person. Highly yeah. educated woman. Um, you have to give us some slack because a woman like that might have seemed to be batty <clears throat> to country folk. No? Right. Right. You have, to, you have to understand, we're talking about a woman who went to college and graduated in science. She, she's a chemistry. Chemist. It's unheard of, unheard of to have exactly. accomplished. Yeah, yeah. And that I'm sure was an, was a problem in the marriage because uh, look, in my day, back in the 50s, a girl wasn't expected to be smarter than the boy she was hoping to go out with. So if we're talking 50s, that mentality that I grew up, lower class, middle class, Brooklyn, the girls uh, had to be pretty and not smarter than the boys. At least that's the message that I got as a child. Well, and one of the, yes, one of the attributes would be pretty, not as smart, and wow, would it be great if you were a cheerleader on top of that? That's what, yeah. So imagine that his mother, Evangeline. She was, yeah, she was way yeah. ahead of her time. Yeah, she was. Women who went to college and look at the family she came from, they were certainly, I, I consider them all crackpots because of an issue about the family, his mother's side that I'm familiar with, I, um, it's called homeopathy. You know about that? Oh, the brand of medicine where oh. you are, yes, where you do natural types of medicines. It's not natural anything. It's a hokey pokey. Hocus, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. not real medicine at all. And I've studied this for years because my dear friend, James Randy just passed away. Uh, he was 92 years old, and I've been his friend for 20 years, and he died uh, two weeks ago, I think it is now. And James Randi spent his life emulating Harry Houdini. Harry Houdini, uh, I, I don't want to get off the track, but I find it interesting, actually, that Lindbergh never mentions Houdini anywhere. You don't even find the name Houdini and Lindbergh together anyplace. And that's unusual to me because Lindbergh loved pranks. Houdini was the master of all of that. And he died in 1926. Lindbergh was already 22 years old when Houdini died. Getting back to Randy, James Randy um, spent his life emulating Harry Houdini, who spent his life after he became a multimillionaire from his fame at uh, tricks, uh, escape tricks. He wasn't just a magician. He escaped no, from caves right. and prison. And underwater. Underwater coffins and all of that stuff. They were just tricks. They were only tricks. The public thought he had psychic phenomena. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and Houdini had to go around uh, writing articles. He, he even came up against of all people, Arthur Conan Doyle, who believed in rule. Arthur Conan Doyle's wife was a psychic, and they believed in psychic uh, talking to the dead and all that, and Houdini was involved. It was major news everywhere in the newspaper headlines around the world. It's amazing to me that I would have noticed, because I'm crazy about Houdini, and so what I want to say getting back to the point. I'm known for getting uh, far away from what we're talking about. Uh, but it isn't really, because what I'm trying to say is his family on his mother's side, they, in my opinion, they were crackpots because uh, homeopathy, which was something that I used to do when I was a young woman in Greenwich Village, I had a homeopathic doctor. I didn't understand the nature of what I thought it was natural medicine, and that sounded pretty good to me. Certainly but, in those days. What? In those days, certainly. 
Well, it isn't natural anything. It's just a crackpot hoax and the people believe in it to the tune of like billions of dollars a year. It's a billion dollar industry that's never going to go away. James Randi uh, went up against it for, I don't know, 30, 40 years of his life. And he took up where Houdini left off in 1926. Houdini uh, died very young, but he he tried to tell the world that his tricks were tricks, okay? He didn't walk through walls. He didn't have mental powers. This is a trick, folks. That's all it is. And Houdini, uh, okay, let's get off Houdini. So Randy, my friend, he went around, uh, you could find it if you put in homeopathy and Randy's name, R-A-N-D-I. He I'll give you an example. Randy would go to speak to a college somewhere. He's, you know, got hundreds and he was very famous and he'd get hundreds of young people and people like me in the audience. And at the beginning of his speech, he would pick somebody from the audience, tell them, here's money, go to the drugstore on the corner and buy this for me. The person would go to the drugstore, come back with the medicine, which was a homeopathic sleeping pill. And Randy in front of the audience would drink the entire bottle. There's maybe 50 homeopathic sleeping pills in this bottle that the kid just got from the drugstore down the corner. And, and Randy would take a glass of water and just gulp every pill down and an hour and a half, two hours later, he was still standing on his feet, very awake, trying to exhibit in reality to the audience what a hoax homeopathy is. If that was real medicine, I would have died. I would have committed suicide, you know, in front of you. So these are the tricks that Randy, the magician, because he was, you never heard of him? The amazing... No. Oh, he, he was on Johnny Carson a million times. Johnny Carson loved, loved uh, magic. The yes. Oh, yes. yes. That's how he started out. Yes. Now, yes. now Sam has done a whole lot of reading about Houdini. Oh. Yes, he's fascinated by well, Houdini. The best book is by Silver, Silverstein. Uh, okay. Ken, and so yeah so okay knows about so so if sam knows about houdini he'll know about randy then too absolutely yeah, oh, because okay. randy's in every book Fine. Uh, Randy wrote a number of books himself and he and the other magicians like um the two guys in las vegas um uh, what are their names the tall one and the little one anyway all the famous magicians worship worship houdini Teller and Teller and somebody. Teller and Penn and Teller. Penn yeah. and Teller, yeah. Yeah, and when you read a book that's written, let's say, from the 50s or 60s on to the present, Randy is in the book usually as a footnote or or um, a story because uh, all of these magicians who became well-known, they, they uh, Houdini is buried. He was Jewish. He's buried in Queens at Machpelah Cemetery, and they went there and they put up a headstone with his likeness. They paid lots of money to put up a carved, what do you call it, um, a likeness of his head, and it got stolen, and they put it back, and then it got, I mean, they, they paid again and again, and people keep stealing the, uh, the sculpture. Um, yeah, so we're talking about Randy and Houdini, um, I'm bringing this up because you're talking about the family and their behavior and their, uh, uh, you know, Lindbergh from both sides had crazy people. I, I don't mean they're bad people. I'm not saying they're bad people. It's just that he's got three generations of homeopathic doctors in his family. And I put on my website a couple of years ago research that took me years to find his grandfather, his mother's uh, grandfather. So it's Lindbergh's great grandfather on his mother's side, Edwin Albert Lodge, was put on trial for murdering his maid, his colored maid. Her name was Martha Washington. 
it's on my website and I put the whole transcript of the trial there. Um, Lindbergh, um, his, his great grandfather on his mother's side uh, used to give homeopathic, you know, in order to create this supposed science called homeopathy, which is really, there's no science in it, none. I, I could tell you why in a minute if you're interested, but um, the, in order to prove, they're called provings, in order to prove that, uh, let's pick an herb, in order to prove that pepper, red pepper, pink pepper, white pepper, that it's uh, worthy of given, uh, worthy of curing headaches, I'm making this up. Well, you've got to give the pepper to somebody with a headache, right? Yes. I mean, how do you go and write books about medicine if you don't know that this white pepper, red pepper, pink pepper works on a headache? You don't know. So how do you find out? You get somebody with a headache and you give it to them. So this is what homeopathy did for 200 years, and they're still, I guess, doing it. They, they uh, test the proving of this herb, which is not even in the medicine. What homeopath homeopathy does is they dilute the pepper. Let's say it's red pepper, okay? So they, the pill that you're going to take is diluted. The red pepper is diluted and then it's diluted again. It's diluted a million times until there's, you ready for this? Until there's no more pepper in the pill. There's no more pepper, there's no more herb, there's no more, homeopathy is a fraud. That's why the FDA does not regulate it. There's no medicine in a homeopathy oh, pill. Yeah, it's there's the Federal Drug it. Administration. So if there's nothing in it. Right, that's why yeah. Randy could drink a whole bottle of sleeping pills and nothing happens to them because there's no medicine in the medicine. They call it med homeopathic medicine, but but the the aim, the man who started this, he was a German guy in England, Hahnemann, and they have to dilute and dilute a hundred times, fifty times until the medicine that originally was there is no longer in the pill. And me, when I was a youngster, I believed in this. I went to homeopathic doctor on Park Avenue uh, for all of my ailments. And then I realized, what am I doing? I should go to a regular doctor. <laughs> so, so this is the nature of his family history. These doctors were cursed by allopathic doctors. They were considered fringe crackpot people. And his great grandfather went on trial on May 21st. 1865, I think was the year, because he gave gelsemium, gelsemium, an herb that's quite dangerous. It's a poison. Not everything in nature is. No, no, no. And he gave this to the colored woman who was his servant. And about within the hour, she ran into his grandfather's office in his bedroom and screaming, begging for help. She couldn't breathe. She laid down on the floor beneath his, uh, his great grandfather's feet and literally died. And he was brought up on charges of killing her, forgiving her. He admitted he didn't see anything wrong with her. He, he claimed that she didn't die from the drug he gave her, but that's what she died from. But they couldn't prove it and his father his grand, great grandfather got away with the whole shebang the whole thing it's all on my website nobody has commented on this immense research that i did for many many years because you have no idea how hard it was to find this transcript and you know who wrote the transcript you're not going to believe this his great grandfather wrote it himself yes there was nothing you know what i think um, I'll tell you what I think, <laughs> I usually do. Um, I don't know how many people know this, but Lindbergh's uncle was the mayor of Detroit. All of this is happening in Detroit. All yeah. of his relatives live in Detroit. He grew up in Detroit. He was born in Detroit, you know, and all of his mother's family is from Detroit. Um, actually, Edwin Lodge, who murdered the maid, he came from Kent, England. Okay. So, that's why I think he called himself Karu Kent, because that's where his his lineage comes from, Kent, England. Well, that, that's where they rented that house. It's in Kent, 
where Darwin Seven was, Oaks. Dar, right, and Darwin, who Lindbergh surely knew about, Darwin lived in Kent as well. So, you know. It all fits. Yeah, it does. To me, it fits. I, I fit everything everywhere I want to fit it. So, you know. well, but anyway, that is homeopathy, and that is the nature of the medicine that his crackpot family, they were probably good. I'm not saying they're bad, evil people. Um, homeopaths believed in what they were doing, and uh, they thought they were better than the regular allopathic doctors, but they killed a lot of people. And I know this because of my friendship with James Randi who spent years and years of his life doing what Houdini, your, your husband will tell you, if he read any book on Houdini, he knows that Houdini was the greatest debunker in the 19th and early 20th century, the greatest debunker of, of pseudoscience and pseudo uh, ideas. Eugenics was a pseudoscience, eugenics, you know, the idea that there's a master race. So how did we get on this topic? I forgot. But that's interesting that nobody has ever commented on the part of my website that I spent more time. <laughs> yeah, that I, was a whole lot of research, Ronnell, that you came up with. Now, I know your whole website isn't still available, but is that part still available on your- My website never changed. It's the forum that got taken off because I didn't own the forum. Let me explain. Oh, the forum okay. that was attached to my website that everybody's asking me, Ronell, what happened to it? That was not mine. It didn't belong to me. It was a free message board that I attached with a link and they took it away after 20 years. I had nothing to do with it. So now there's a forum that I put on the website that nobody's posting on. It's difficult to figure it out. It's complicated. But there is now a forum that you can go and argue with people. And that's part of my website now. But your question was, is this information about his great grandfather still on my website? Of course, I never took anything down. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. terrific. Then I will go. I'll be fascinated to read that. Now, of course, when you're talking about a Lindbergh giving someone something to drink and they die, immediately I get very worried for <laughs> violent sharp. Oh. Especially. Oh, I thought you were going to say Bud Gurney. No, Violet Sharp. Yeah. Wait till you read the book on, um, you held up a book about Wild Bill Donovan. I have that book. Yes. When yeah. You read, when you read that book, if you read the whole thing, I don't know if you read every page. No, I do. I, I'm one of those read every page girls. Yeah, okay. with a pencil and I'm underlining and notes on the side. Yeah. Okay, well, you're going to come across a section. It's not, it's not, the author didn't focus on it, but it's true because I looked into it. Because of Violet Sharp drinking uh, silver polish, I looked in on the internet to every person who drank silver polish. That's in the news or whatever for a hundred yeah. years. Yeah. Wild Bill Donovan's granddaughter at the age of four or five killed herself by drinking silver polish in the bathroom. Now, I have always wondered about these cases because of Violet Sharp. And look at who Wild Bill Donovan was. He was a master of uh, spy. OSS. Right, right. And there may have been people wanting to get even with him. And when they want to get even with you, sometimes they do things to your, to your relatives. And that child died. I think she was five years old at the time. Now, what child drinks silver polish? What why is silver, really? And why is silver polish in the bathroom? Right, but um, they've they've made silver polish without cyanide because too many people were using it for suicide attempts or whatever. I don't believe, like you probably would agree, that's, that Violet Sharp did not commit suicide. No, she didn't take her life. 
No, I, I don't believe that. She, well, no. Well, she did nothing. First of all, she did nothing wrong. We know that. She was not involved. Um, so that, you know, that's, that's the main number one, huge number one. Right. And number two, like you and I have mentioned before, if you're going to take your life, you do not run down the stairs almost asking for help. You exactly. You've done upstairs, you stay in your bed and, and you now, that's your let, fate, you know. Let me ask you something. How do we know? Because I don't remember the source for that. But I remember reading in several books that Violet Sharp ran out down the stairs screaming for help. Am I right in that? I that's what I read. I'm not sure about the screaming, but I know she ran downstairs. Well, why are you running away from the thing you want to do? You want to commit suicide, no. you drink it and lay down. And and she didn't do that. No. Many people agree, many, many people I've spoken with over the years think Lindbergh killed her. Yeah. He was there. He was I mean, house. yeah. Yeah. And I thought you were going to bring up Bud Gurney with the kerosene. Because later on, when Lindbergh had to make excuses for what he did to Bud Gurney, his excuse was that back in Minnesota, uh, the loggers would drink uh, alcohol. Uh, they would drink a little kerosene. He, that was his excuse when Bud Gurney later uh, yeah. accused him. Yeah. Um... I'm, I've gotten two different accounts of the Bud Gurney kerosene thing. Really? One, one is in Lisa Perlman's where she says that Bud Gurney wound up in the hospital with a severely burnt throat from the kerosene. Then we have in Berg's book, I think about Bud Gurney with a in the hospital with a severely burnt throat, as opposed to what Berg reports, um, A. Scott Berg, Lindbergh also delighted for decades, delighted for decades in the time he got Bud Gurney to swallow two big gulps of kerosene, having led him to believe it was water. Um, that was no joking matter. No. If 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 Bud ended up in the hospital with a severely burnt throat. Well, if you look on newspapers.com in the uh let's see, it would have to be after 27, because that's when Lindbergh's name hit the headlines. It would be like 20 28 in the in the years 28 or 29 bud gurney wrote a series of articles about his uh, about his close they were very close very uh, he called him buddy uh, i have some of the uh, letters that they wrote between the two of them and um yeah they were very close and bud gurney had a reawakening of his whatever it was either the baby dying or Lindbergh becoming famous Bud Gurney never spoke to Lindbergh after that kerosene ordeal and they made up years later either after Lindbergh became famous for going to Paris or maybe it was in the aftermath of the kidnapping but uh, what was I trying to tell you? Yes. If you want to know the story, you can read Bud Gurney's own version of it. Only thing is, I don't even trust that because Gurney probably covered for many of Lindbergh's. I, I don't even, I don't trust anybody who writes about Lindbergh. Uh, and I don't expect no. people to trust me when I write about Lindbergh, but uh, Bud Gurney was a lifelong friend of Charles Lindbergh till the day he died. He adored and loved him, but that kerosene thing came between them for many years, and then they made up. I don't remember why they made up which moment, but he did write a series of articles. It's in newspapers.com, and you can read it. And that would be Bud Gurney's own 
uh, own story, which I guess is more reliable than the authors, especially Scott Berg. I mean, you know, or yeah. anybody. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. A lot of wow. people okay. wrote for the newspapers because they knew Lindbergh before he was Lindbergh, you know, and they wanted to get publicity for themselves or be famous on his coattails. So, yeah. Sure. And well, you'd want to be, you'd want to be fairly complimentary at that point and right. talk about your good friendship and closeness and what you did together. You wouldn't want to disparage someone with making the kerosene incident maybe as bad as it really was. Yeah, but Gurney yeah. does. He does. He does. And okay, he that'll be fascinating to read. He's scathing about what happened to him. He okay. doesn't pull punches, but in the end, they were lifelong friends till the day Lindbergh died. So, but at the time, he was quite angry, never forgave him. And I, I've been to the Library of Congress where Lindbergh made, I don't know, 70 pages each of the Kenneth Davis book. Yes. So, you know about that, right? Kenneth yes. Davis book. Yeah. Single, single spaced typewritten notes about errata yeah that he he yeah. supposedly found and right in in that those commentaries that he wrote about the uh, kenneth davis and gill brendan gill's book there were two books when Lindbergh was alive gill yes. wrote a book and kenneth davis and in there he says that he's ashamed of it oh yeah he said that he's sorry that he did it but this is in the 50s and 60s, he's saying it. He does yeah. make a comment about, uh, yeah. I, Brendan Gill's, it's Brendan Gill's book. Oh yeah? In Brendan, Brendan Gill, right. That's who it is, yeah. yeah. Lundberg does comment in, in those errata notes that he gave to the LOC. He comments that he's, that's the only prank that he doesn't brag about, that he doesn't uh, be sorry about. Because let me tell you, he was never sorry about buckets over the doors, people at, at Ryan, when they were making the Spirit of St. Louis, he already had buckets of water over the door. So right. the person who walked through got soaking wet. I mean, yeah. he, he did things all of his life like that and never regretted a single, he bragged about it. He loved, he thought it, and his wife thought he was a child. And Morrow correctly uh, comments in many places that he's very childish. He's like a yeah. boy. She called him a boy even after he died, right? I mean, even, yeah. even coming home on the Memphis after his flight, he played tricks on the Memphis, he couldn't. Right. Well, Memphis, Memphis, the baby was missing and he was playing pranks in the plane with Henry Breckenridge. He rewired the airplane. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. He, he put ice, he put, what is that? Cold? Dried ice, dried ice, ice down Ada Breckenridge's dress. Um, serious burns with that. I, you know, if we only know, could know, what happened to Ada really after he put dry? I mean, he had to have carried the dry ice himself with tongs or like in a in a oh, dish towel yeah. or something. You can't handle it. Right. So right. he he knew it was caustic to skin because he couldn't have handled it himself. And then he put it puts it down a woman's back. Um uh, and he started these pranks even when his dad was in Washington, D.C. What was the thing? Um, like Berg's, Berg what mentioned. Was the thing? What? what was the thing? What? Uh, there was something about light bulbs in Washington. Yes. What yes. Was he dropped light bulbs from the third floor of the house office building down to the third sidewalk below to see what if it was on its four feet light bulb doesn't have feet <laughs> no he did that with a cat to check that out but 
yes, from one of their boarding houses that he had with his mother, but it was light bulb from the top of the of the house office building. And then um, there was a dumbwaiter trick that he was pulling on everybody. The dumbwaiter in the, in the house, the House of Representatives, there was something about a dumb, you know, he was using the dumbwaiter to take rides. And then he would get Kermit Roosevelt to pay the bill on the sodas. And did you ever hear that one? I don't know where he did. I did. Had Kermit Roosevelt do what? Well, Kermit Roosevelt was his uh, contemporary, and they went to the yeah. friends, the friends' school in Washington when he lived yes. there. Yes. And uh, Kermit Roosevelt uh, was so rich that he took all the boys to sodas every day to the soda shop, and uh, something about their relationship. Lindbergh knew everybody. There's not a person on earth who didn't want to know him. And, you know, it's amazing. It is amazing. Even, even reading in one of Anne's journals about spending the evening with Frank Lloyd Wright and his crazy wife. Yeah, they knew everybody. Frank they Lord knew Wright. everybody. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I know about Lindbergh and Frank Lloyd Wright is that Wright adored Lindbergh and sent him a telegram when he started making pro-Nazi speeches. Frank Lloyd Wright believed that he was on, he was with him on the, the, he, Frank Lloyd Wright was, I, I don't know much about the guy, but he agreed with Lindbergh when he made all those pro-Nazi speeches during the 30s and 40s. That's all I know about, right? I'm, I mean, he was a great architect, but uh, Anne, she was a sensitive person who loved art and music and literature and this, how she got herself involved with this crazy person. Um, and he just used her. She's crew, remember? She's just crew. They told they told him, don't take your wife on this trip. It's dangerous. No, well, she's crew. Yeah, she's crew. You know, um, this was in Berg's book. Um, when she was talking about seeing Dr. Rosen, her psychiatrist, this is the saddest thing I think, well, now that we've read Lisa Perlman's book, I don't think we could get a sadder book than that, Infanticide. But this is this ranks right up there. She says, um, but her unhappiness was undeniable and she came to crave the appointments, which she attended every day of the summer of 1952. Although we know it was two years that she really saw Dr. Rosen. She said, I spent a year or two in therapy just crying, she would later admit. Yeah. Imagine that. She was going actually every day. And, um, uh, and, then, and then this was another sad thing, you know. By the way, what, what were the years that she went? Well, I guess it was 52, somewhere in the early 52, in the summer of summer, at least during the summer of 52, and then thereabouts for two years around that period, early so 50s. What do you see of her marriage at that time that would prompt her to take such a step? Because going to a psychotherapist is not an easy decision for anybody to make, which is why she cried for two years. A person, I'm very familiar with this. I know a lot of shrinks and people just sit in the chair or lie on the couch and they cry and they can't talk. And they, this could go on for years. It's not unusual. It's pathetic, yes, because obviously something is hurting her deep inside and she cannot talk about it. And well... Yeah, you know, I think about this a lot. Think about, think about the person she married who 
when she married him, she thought he was a demigod or maybe even a god. She writes early on about how she even loved his thumbs. And everybody, the whole world adored him. She loved okay? his thumbs. Everybody, no, no. she loved his thumbs. What? Yes. She said even his thumbs. What? Where did she say that? Probably in Bring Me a Unicorn early on in there. He loved yeah. his thumbs? Uh, I will find that for you right now. If that's not a phallic symbol, I don't know what is. Yeah, right? well, that's true. That's he true. Loved yeah. his thumbs? Yeah, yes. Yes, I when she know. went, when he was in, when he came down to Mexico City and he took her and Constance and Mrs. Morrow up in the airplane, she was even amazed all the way to his thumbs. <laughs> So, so imagine she's she's married to this godlike person whom everybody adores, and everybody's envious of her for having caught this man, and he never really lives with her. No, she bears all these children. She endures all this morning sickness. Um, and, you know, um, she writes, she writes, um, oh, this is in Berg's book on page 515. Um, this is a quote of hers. It was quite sad to come back and find you gone. Anne wrote Charles during one of her returns to Connecticut with only the suit to be cleaned sitting on your side of the bed. I mean, she, she never knew where he was. She was, she could never find out where he was. Um, and then, you know, imagine your husband just coming home and dropping off his laundry, putting it on the bed not like a love note on her pillow or anything like that, just a suit to be cleaned on the bed. She, the dichotomy of living with a man who was so incredibly cold towards her and making her inventory the rubber bands in the house and how much she spent for him. Rubber bands? Yes, she had to account for rubber bands she bought in one book I read. And paper clips too. I know that he yeah. was crazy for paper clips. They had to yeah. be glass so they wouldn't get a rust. He was crazy. I, I, I guess you call this uh, obsessive compulsive? Is that what you call it? He yeah, right. And the inventories he used to make of everything. You kind of wonder if Dana actually had been, had said to Anne, I'm leaving my wife. I think her name was Mary. I think I'm, le I'm going to leave my wife. That leaves us, if you divorce Charles, it leaves us free to marry. If she would have because she was thinking of divorcing him, certainly. Right. Um, I wonder if he had actually been available for marriage, what would have happened for her? How do you go from a world hero like Charles Lindbergh to a doctor? It's well, her ego. It's her ego as well as his. We're, yeah, not, we're not taking account of Anne Morrow's ego. All the women in the world, first of all, nobody's going to know the reason why she's divorcing him. No one will know that he's um, a miserable human being that's making her life uh, unlivable. They're all going to think that Anne is the crazy one for getting rid of him. Isn't that what the public will know about her? No? It'll, it'll, the news. Exactly. Right. And then he writes with obviously her help, the spirit of St. Louis, and she calls it, she's very jealous of his book because he got that out before her 
big blockbuster, The Gift from the Sea, a great moment in history, greatly told by a man of greatness. She yeah. couldn't get, yes, you're right, Ronell. She couldn't get rid of that, could she? Yeah. It so would, she, it would she reflect her. on her own. Um, yes. It would reflect on her own uh, image or her own uh, pers her own reputation. She would be the one. You, look, we know that women uh, were. What can I? What can you say? Women were not appreciated to say the least and they were going to be the blame for everything that there were people back then okay who believed that if anything bad went wrong it's always the woman's fault and she would have known that yes it's this, isn't it the same jackie knew jackie kennedy well knew that john was fooling around with everybody well, could she have ever left him no. no, no, we don't no. know of any presidential wives who've done that anyway, do we? Are there any? Uh, no, no, you're stuck when it's somebody that renowned and somebody that famous who's part of history. You're really stuck. There's nothing you can do about it. And Anne was stuck. Well, she really wasn't. I mean, she was from powerful people, for goodness sakes, Morgan Bank. She's related to the people, you know, by uh, business relationship yeah. with the Morgan Bank. Yeah. But still stuck. I mean, she would have had money marrying a physician, a, a well-known yeah. physician who earned plenty of money um, being the doctor for the high-powered Greta Garbo and uh, uh, Catherine Hepburn. Right. But yes, indeed. What would that have looked like? So she she did her own little life of subterfuge, didn't she? Yeah. Getting her apartment, yeah. having at least one affair, maybe the one with Alan Valentine. I really think she had an affair with Alan well, Valentine. Tell us about that, because I don't think people know that. How does he Yes. Know? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. Uh, Alan Valentine, was a neighbor, a, a, I don't know how near or how far, in Englewood. And the Moros knew Alan Valentine, Anne and Charles knew Alan Valentine. And who was, who was he? He ended up, I don't know what his, maybe he was a professor, but he ended up becoming president of the University of Rochester here. Oh, that's what you told me. Yes. So in the book Against Wind and Tide, which was posthumously published by her diaries and letters by Reeve, Reeve put a footnote when Alan Valentine was mentioned and said that Alan Valentine provided great, and this is what she wrote, Reeve wrote in the footnote that Alan Valentine provided great comfort to Anne at the time of the kidnapping in Hopewell. And that's not mm -hmm. as anybody knows. No, no. And then there are many, many letters between later on between from from Anne to Alan Valentine. We don't see his letters to her because it you know it doesn't work that way but they stayed they stayed very close i have i've seen on ebay just now uh, currently um a photo of ann in the back of the car with her academic regalia on cap and gown right and she was receiving a an honorary degree from the university of rochester Oh. And she's in the back seat of the car with an unnamed man. And I just bet you anything that has to be Alan Valentine. I know that photograph. I've seen it often. Yeah. She's with a man in the car at that time. Yeah. And, and he would have been there as her, you know, uh, sponsor of, you know, for this honorary degree that she got here. Uh, 
he looks quite happy. She's looking out the window. Um, what year? What year was that? I don't know the year. I don't know that the, the photo isn't isn't really well documented on the back of it and it it doesn't say who he is so that's only you know a guess on my part that maybe that was alan valentine well, they would have wanted to spend time together it may be on newspapers.com uh if we look for the name valentine and and limber and, and do we need to know the date also when we look on no okay just put it in okay yeah so I and, put and it into the state of new york okay because it's okay. most likely a new york photographer that took the picture and yes it, yeah you know. since we're pretty much in the backwoods here right now in rochester <laughs> <laughs> I'd, love to be in, I'd love to be in your backwoods <laughs> it's a great city yeah it's a great city um we're so close to canada yes we're the problem is we're so close yet so far. Why, two hours away? Yeah, I know, but they're not letting us in. Oh, oh, well, I don't mean that. Yeah, 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 they're not letting you in. Yeah. We're desperate to go. We had an offside. We had, we thought we were pretty safe. Actually, we thought we were really safe. You know, we didn't know how long the virus was going to last. Right. So Sam and, the guy, and I got tickets for uh, the musical Gypsy um, at Niagara-on-the-Lake, where they have the Great Shaw Festival there. We got them for the last show of the season, which was October 2nd. Oh. We thought we were pretty safe. Well, then we also got tickets for Toronto for the Royal Conservatory for the pianist Stuart Goodyear for November 20th. That looked pretty safe. <laughs> But that's that concert isn't happening on November twentieth either. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. you're still lucky to be near there. We are. We love going. You know, that's our big city. It's a it's a little bit closer than New York City, and um, it's it's great for lots of cultural events. Yeah. Speaking of New York City, we've got to get another meeting going somehow with Richard Sloan and. Uh, you know, I don't know what happened to Romeo. He keeps telling me he's going to come on Zoom with me. And he he went out and bought a laptop. He didn't want to do it on his cell phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't know what the, Steve Romeo has disappeared. And I guess he's gotten camera shy. Can you imagine <laughs> Romeo being shy? No, oh. I've written, I've, I've, I've connected with Steve Romeo. I've written to him and told him definitely you have to do a zoom chat with ronnell you'll really enjoy it steve i know him yes. for 20 years and he's always sent me videos and books and uh, i have a lot of videos thanks to steve because he uh, unfortunately i shouldn't use that expression but he's a friend of jim fisher's yeah he's got all kinds of videos uh, there's one that i treasure it's Jim Fisher debating Anthony Scaduto in Jim Fisher's college where he teaches, Edinburgh College. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, um, it's very interesting. Anyway. Do you uh, know, this will, um, this, this reminds me, um, one time I was talking to, to, um, Richard Sloan. This makes me feel better. It should make us all feel better about forgetting facts about the case. There was a very specific question that Richard, Richard went to some kind of Scaduto event and he got a chance to ask a question of Scaduto. And so he asked Anthony Scaduto his specific question and Scaduto replied to him, I don't know. That was so long ago that I wrote that book. <laughs> so we all have to um, be gentle with ourselves when we either don't remember or only half remember, and we're not sure where we remember reading it. I always think back to Scaduto answering Richard Sloan that way, and it makes me feel better. 
Yeah. Oh, once you've written your book, a lot of stuff goes out of your brain. Yeah. You just don't remember where you got something from. And people who read these books expect the author to, you know, be a walking library. Yes. But yeah. That way. Uh, yeah. What else in Lisa Perlman's book uh, did you uh, find interesting? Um, absolutely the most uh, compound. Well, this is fascinating. Um, it, it, the end of the book where we could read the Squib report and S Dr. Speth's report on what he thought of all the findings. I just was looking in Berg's book and two things strike me here. Um, when um, William Allen found the skeleton in the woods, he's going back to then um, upon um, uh, finding the spot where the, where the baby, the body was, two officers came back to that area, the Princeton Hopewell Road observed a burlap sack. Now it says, listen to this in Berg's book, worn and blood stained. No. And then on the ground, just off the side of the road. So Berg just, just acted as though this is fine that the burlap sack was at the side of the road. Well, Lisa Perlman says, wait a minute here. It was at the side of the road. People would have seen it from March 1st on till May 12th. Let's not just accept that it was sitting there, lying there on the side of the road for, for those two and a half months. And where in the world Berg gets this information that it was bloodstained because no blood was found no. anywhere near anything. Yeah. And he doesn't talk about the bone found in the burlap bag either. Well, I don't think a person interested in the in the kidnap murder would use Berg as a source. I mean, it's eight hundred. No, you couldn't use Berg as a source, but it's not reliable. I don't. For one thing, I have a very big problem with the way he, you know, his account of the kidnap murder. Uh, the case, he does. He pulls a very sneaky trick. He's sneaky. Uh, let's remember, he's a family authorized author. Exactly. So you can't forget that when you read Berg. Now, he juxtaposes many, many pages apart many pages, I don't know if it's 10 pages or a whole chapter apart, Governor Hoffman trying to reopen the case. And then a chapter later, the Lindberghs are leaving America. He, it's a very, I can't remember how he does it, but he's sneaky in that he never lets the reader understand that the leaving America has to do with Governor Hoffman. He separates it by a whole chapter. And anybody reading it would have no clue. And no. even the New York Times, all the newspapers, I went back to look, they do mention that Hoffman's reopening is making Lindbergh leave the country. It is mentioned in the newspaper. So it's not like nobody knew it. And it's in the New York Times, which is uh, Scott Berg should have been using the New York Times uh, because that's such a major paper. Even the New York Times mentions it, that it's Governor Hoffman's um, reopening that is making life miserable for Lindbergh. Okay, they misrepresent it as well. But Berg, oh my God, the sneakiest, sneakiest author on Lindbergh that you could ever, uh, first of all, the guy never knew that Lindbergh was making babies in Germany. 10 years, he, he bragged and bragged to everyone about how he's the only biographer, the only authorized biographer. I'm the only one that has access to Yale. None of that was true, but he bragged and bragged and ended up looking like a total, I want to be nice, a total what? 
when your job is to research a person's life and you don't know there are seven children, <laughs> you don't know he has seven no. children with women in Germany, what kind of biographer are you? No, it's, no, it's, <laughs> yeah. And, well, you know, I've wondered, um, because it is hard to get access to the Yale archives. Well, I think uh, they let you in. Lisa said that they let her in or they let somebody in. They don't, it's just certain uh, boxes that you don't have access to. There are, it is open for people. I, I should go there, but I don't want to travel now. You can go there. Okay. It's not as closed as it used to be or what we thought it was. I don't know. If you well, look in the private papers, you need permission from Reed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I'm not. Okay. So there's, so there's some, I, I understood before that it was only for the photos that they were open to anybody, but now more is oh, open. Photos. Yeah. I would love to look at the photos. Yeah. I, Reeve was here for a book signing. Uh, years ago, and I, I, I said to her, I think it's very odd that there are no pictures of your brother after he was a year old when he died when he was twenty months old. You said that to her? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Wow. But, <laughs> but I, but I gave her a nice gift though too. Um, um, it was Joyce Milton who explained how Evangeline Land Lindbergh ended up in Little Falls. It was because she read a book called The Great River. Mm -hmm. And I found I had a copy of The Great River. I guess I gave her my copy. So she would have a copy of how her grandmother ended up in Little mm -hmm. Falls. So, but I did ask about the baby and uh, the photo of uh, why there's no photo. And she said, well, she said, you, you can access photos at Yale. That's not a problem. Well, <laughs> yeah. I should go. So that, you know, and I'm also wondering, do you think Scott Berg went to the archives in, in West Trenton and questioned? Sure. Yeah, he, did. He, did. he did? Yeah. He did. Okay. okay. I'm pretty sure that Mark uh, helped him. Yeah. Mark helps every author. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure he went there. But um, he's not he's not going to do a really skeptical search of what might have happened. He's there to prove that Lindbergh was a worthy person who didn't kill his baby. And, you know, when he wrote that book, Algren and Monier, Scott Berg published in 98, Algren and Monia published in 93. So five years Scott Berg had to read their book. And when he came to Miami to the Miami Book Fair, I confronted him. The audience was like 500 people. And I know when Scott Berg appears somewhere, he answers three questions and he leaves. I knew yeah. He only takes one or two, three questions from three people and he, he doesn't stand like most authors for a long time and answer questions. So I got to the microphone before anybody else and I asked him why he didn't include Algren and Monier in his book. And he right. said to me, when you write your own book, you can include whatever you want in your book. Well, I was, I was not, not, I mean, I was rude to him. I was angry about his book. Um, yeah, but that was, he didn't give you an answer. That wasn't an answer to your question, actually. That well, was. I asked him why he left Algren and Monia out yeah. of his book, because Lindbergh might have killed his own child. Well, the audience gasped when I said that. Good. 500 they learned. People, they gasped. They but learned something new. This was all recorded on C-SPAN, by the way, and it was shown on television. They, you couldn't see me. You could hear my voice. Uh, and then I didn't sit down and I said to him, well, did the Lindbergh family uh, tell you, uh, how did I put it? Did the Lindberghs, uh, 
what's the word? When not authorized, did the Limbergs tell you how to write the book? Did they have anything to do with editing your book or and it, and he was indignant. Oh, that's when he got angry at me. Oh, he was enraged when when I asked him, did they tell you? Because I already knew before I went to that Miami book show. I knew from Noel Bain on the telephone. Noel Bain told me that Scott Berg had gone to Reeve in Vermont and she edited about 800 pages, took out loads of pages from Scott Berg's manuscript. So I already knew that and I asked him, did the Lindberghs constrain oh. or did they tell you what to, did they edit your book? Oh yeah. my God, did he get angry? Um, and then I asked him, I wouldn't sit down because I knew the guy is sneaky. I forgot the third question. I think I have a copy of the video because it was shown several times on C-SPAN. Not me specifically, but the whole, you know, Miami Book Fair is the largest book fair in America. And I got to challenge Reeve. She came with her books. I don't go there anymore. All these people can come and go as they please. I don't go there to challenge anybody anymore in the audience. I'm tired of that because, you know, it makes me look like, uh... anyway. Yeah, I've met Reeve, confront I've confronted her about uh, her mother, her father at these places, you know. I'm not like you, I don't bring gifts. To people oh. that um, <laughs> that I think are liars, they're all liars because look, they have an interest in promoting Lindbergh and um, the family. Now John and uh, what's his name, Land and John, and the other one Scott. You never hear from them. They're nowhere. They they never talk about anything. You don't even know if they're alive or dead. No. So, no. I guess if they had died, it would be in the newspaper, perhaps, but they're not interested in promoting their father or their mother. No, no. Who no, does no. all of it. Yes. And, and they need to have Lindbergh uh, be an, uh, an honorable hero of the past. But how much can you support his seven children? <laughs> No, especially when he was in the environmentalist and worried about overpopulation. Right. So this is the man who had uh, 12 children in the end. That's a good yeah. point, but they're not yeah. ordinary 12 children. They're superior 12 children. Yes, the superior 12. They're not you know, um, when I went to the Morvan Museum to see that Charles and Ann Lindbergh um, display at the museum, um, Scott Berg did a talk then at, in Princeton at the McCarter Theater. Oh. And somebody, somebody asked him about um, Lindbergh's 12 or, you know, seven children in Germany and his mistresses there. And um, his tone was as snotty as could be. He said, well, you know about Anne. So he said, in her affairs. So apparently he said, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. No. He, he excused Lindbergh's behavior as though Lindbergh knew about this and was almost in retaliation mode and had every right and had every right. I don't believe this. Yes, he was as snotty as could be. I'm amazed he turned it around to blame Anne for yes, making you, Lindbergh go off with mistresses. In exactly. And, and you, and, 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 but that's easy to believe. That would be Scott Berg, wouldn't it? Oh my goodness. Where did he get that from? Where did he get the hook and, to, to yeah, but a liar? I, he was probably ready for that question, you know, because people right. then, would be wanting to know. So I don't understand why you didn't know about the seven children mm -hmm. and three women in Germany. And uh, how about Lindbergh's behavior? Well, right. he stood up for he stood up for his friend 
Mr. Lindbergh all right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm not sure Lindbergh would have been his friend. Um, well, maybe, who knows, but. Well, I mean, Scott Berg made a lot of money off of Charles Lindbergh on that book and he right. won his little Pulitzer Prize. Right, but yeah. he didn't get the movie. No, no. And that no. has to do with my letter to the forward. Well, maybe sometime I could talk about that. I wrote a letter to the Jewish newspaper comparing Lindbergh, the hero, to my husband, who's a Holocaust survivor. And four days later, Steven Spielberg dropped the movie. Because yeah. my husband was recorded by Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg was making a movie of that book. It was already in the cards when, when, when Berg was writing that. And Spielberg is a benefactor of Holocaust memory because he spent millions of dollars to record the, the stories of people like my husband who was born in Paris and lost everybody in Auschwitz. And uh, so my husband, they, Spielberg filmed it. It's in the Holocaust Museum in Washington. The movie is in, uh, it's in uh, Yad Vashem in Israel. There, so Spielberg is a very important person to Holocaust memory. And I could not believe that he was going to make a movie about Lindbergh with his Nazi medal based on wow. the book. I don't care if they make a movie about Lindbergh as long as they tell the truth. And the yeah. book is not truthful. That's why I wrote the letter and Spielberg dropped the movie four days later announced in the New York Times. My phone was ringing off the hook from my letter in the forward newspaper people calling me up, uh, telling me how right I was, that uh, this Lindbergh is a, um, a disgrace. And, okay, so I don't want to belabor it because it's already five o'clock. Okay. I think it's five o'clock. We've been talking for two hours. Yeah. You want yeah. to meet next Friday again? And, and Sure, uh, we could talk that'd be about great. Yeah. Maybe by next Friday, we'll solve the case. You know, <laughs> uh, we could do it. We could do it in a week, Ron, now. Yeah. Let's try. You're okay. Say hello no. to your wonderful husband who helps you with the technology. And, yeah, yeah. And um, yes, so thank you so much, Nancy. We that was great, Ron, now. Another two hours, but. Yeah, I learned so much from you. Every time we talk, right. Ron, now, it's fascinating for me. Well. Thank you. I've got nothing else to do. That's what I do in Florida. I read books like you do. You're the same as yeah. me. Yeah, we yeah. We share all of our information. And Fantastic. Thanks. Great. Okay, Thanks. take care. Be well, Ronnell. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 And, and <laughs> I don't know how to, there. And, and meeting for all.